name is Massimo, and I grew up in a place called Locri, which is a town in the very far south of Italy in a place called Calabria. Locri is a very beautiful place, and in many ways, I was lucky to grow up there. But in the other ways, being born there comes with a bit of a curse. Locri and Calabria in general has beautiful scenery, incredible food, and mostly the people are very friendly too. But Locri also has a dark side, and its name is Undrangheta. I apologize in advance for the crazy spelling, it's very distinct to Calabria. You say the word like Andrangheta, and it comes from a Greek word meaning heroic or valorous, but like many words that come from much older ones, the meaning and intention has been greatly obscured. Because the Andrangheta are not heroes, they are not the valiant defiant. They are scum, they are cowards, and they are a plague to anyone and everyone unfortunate enough to cross their path. Not long after I turned 14 years old, my mother told me that she could not afford to give me money anymore. I had a small allowance for things, much like American children do, but there soon came a time when I wanted more than my meager allowance would permit. And so, instead of raising my allowance, she asked a friend to find me a job. Nothing big, just something small so I had a few thousand lira to spend each week, and soon I had a job. I was told that I would be working in a small nightclub just a few hours on a Friday and Saturday night. I suspect my mother believed that I would be disappointed that I no longer had those times of the weekend to myself, but it was actually the opposite. I was worried that she would find me something boring, like working in a supermarket or something disgusting like working in a slaughterhouse. So to learn that I would spend my time watching beautiful women dancing and drinking, that was some very welcome news to a 14-year-old boy like myself. There were only around two or three nightclubs in Locri where I lived there, spreading along the Corso Vittorio e Muele, which is the road nearest to the beach. They were all spread out for a reason, as each club was the responsibility of a different undrangete captain, or capo, as they say. All these capos were part of the same Undrangheta clan, but they were not immune from internal disputes and rivalries. The story goes that after one of the capos mysteriously went missing, his deputy stepped up to take his place. But one of the other capos protested, saying the man was his brother-in-law, and until he was found, he had the right to take over responsibility for the missing capo's nightclub, as well as his own. He told the missing capos Andrina, which is like his personal gang members, to move out so his own crew could take over, but the original Andrina refused. They accused the other capo of orchestrating their boss's disappearance, an accusation which was returned by the man's brother-in-law. The two groups squabbled for a while, but the crimine, which is something like the higher council, told them to stop while they tried to track down the missing capo. I worked in the bar of the missing capo, although at the time I knew nothing of it. I knew some very suspicious-looking guys used to hang out around the nightclub, looking mean and not drinking very much, but I didn't understand their wider connection to the invisible feud. I use that word deliberately, too, because that's where the undrangete are. In America, I feel if gangsters like to represent themselves, they wear colors, they make signs, they make graffiti marking their territory, but in Locri... There was nothing like that. The Undrangete are invisible. They are your neighbor, your co-worker, your brother, your cousin, and all but a few dozen are known only to each other. They act only in the darkness, and they emerge from the shadows and they disappear again. I remember cycling down to the Corso Vittorio Omonuele to begin my shift on a Friday evening. Locri is quite lively at that time of the evening, especially on a weekend and the nightclub I worked at was no different. I walked in and the place was full, lots of people upstairs and lots of people downstairs also. The way the club was set up was when you walk in, there is a bar and a few tables for people to sit at, then downstairs is the dance floor. But the upstairs has a kind of balcony which overlooks the dance floor, but not by much. The club was very busy and I was going upstairs and downstairs collecting empty bottles and glasses as I went. I had just collected two armfuls of empty wine glasses, which probably wasn't a lot for a kid like me, and I'd placed them up onto the bar top for the bartender to wash. I then turned around in time to see a guy walking up to the small balcony. I'd never seen him before, 
and we had a lot of the same people coming in week after week, so I noticed him almost right away. His behavior was also a little strange to me because I'd say 99% of all people who walked in went straight to the bar to get a drink before heading down to the dance floor. So, to have this man ignore the bar completely and walk straight to the balcony, it was almost like he was looking or watching for someone. The bartender and I watched the guy for a minute wondering why he was just standing there, still like a statue, and then someone else came to the bar so we got back to work. But then, just as I was walking away from the bar, I saw the strange man take something out of the pocket of his jacket and then toss it over the side of the balcony. He then turned and walked away, so calmly that it made the action seem almost sort of innocent. I watched him walk towards the front entrance and then turn back to walk towards the balcony. I was worried that he might have tossed a bottle or empty glass down onto the dance floor, then was wondering how that might be if he hadn't visited the bar. And then, there was a bang. At first, the noise and concussion of the blast scared me so much that I almost fell backwards. There was no fire. It wasn't like an explosion you see in a movie. There was a bang and then a puff of smoke. And then the music stopped and all I heard were people screaming. I ran to the balcony and could see lots of people lying on the dance floor. Most were moving around in pain, holding parts of themselves that had been hurt but two or three were just laying completely still. Many of those that weren't affected by this explosion began running up the stairs away from the wounded people and out of the club, but many others stayed and tried to help. The bartender told me to stand at the bottom of the stairs and to help wounded people climb them. He did the same, and soon, only the worst affected were still lying on the floor with their friends trying to stop the bleeding from their wounds. The ambulances were outside very quickly, and after the paramedics came inside and I asked the bartender if I could help any further, he seemed angry that I'd asked him, which I suppose looking back was him realizing that I shouldn't have been there in the first place. I was just a kid and he asked me to help with the wounded. I guess he felt guilty about that so he snapped at me and told me to just go home. I had wanted to run out of that place since the moment I heard the bang and saw the wounded people, but for some reason I stayed and... I think it was more out of pure curiosity, in a sort of morbid way. Once I finally realized what had happened, or at least that something truly terrible had happened, I was only too glad to jump on my bike and go home. From where we lived, my mom could hear all the sirens and see all the flashing lights, so when I walked through the door with blood on my clothes and terror in my eyes, she knew instantly that I had somehow been involved. I'm not ashamed to say that I cried a lot in her arms. I wasn't scared anymore, but it was all the tension being let loose like some sort of river. I was just so glad to be home alive and in her embrace. The next day, the police came to talk to me about the attack. They visited in the daytime. The Ondrangheta, on the other hand, they visited us at night. They were far more thorough than the police officers. They asked me more questions, demanded more details, and obviously wanted to find the man who'd thrown the explosive onto the dance floor, much more than the police did, too. I don't know if they ever did, but a lot of people died in the process. Like I said, the Undrangheta violence is mostly done quietly and in the shadows, but for a while, Lokri and the surrounding region erupted into violence as the two rival Andrina fought one another. It got so bad that my mother sent me to live with my cousins up in Cosenza, which is a town quite far to the north of Locri, until things had died down. I eventually returned home with my parents, but my mother was never fully happy there again. A few years later, we moved to Reggio Calabria, and that's where we've been living ever since. I think we are all much happier here because, as much as we still miss Locri, there are one too many bad memories for us to be at peace there. For me, it's being reminded of the blood and the screaming, how I'd stared in disbelief until it hit me later while hugging my mom. But for her, it was having that silent and invisible monster that stalks Calabria, suddenly becoming very loud and very visible when it almost took her only son. This event took place when I was in college and occurred way before there were things like cell phones. 
I was an undergraduate at the time and attended a school located in the Appalachian Mountains. The school was in a small town and I soon came to realize that the townies, that is, people who grew up there, didn't much care for us students. I was a junior at the time and it happened during a cold winter. I had heard a story regarding a certain townie that liked to frequent a popular bar called The Club. It was a place frequented by both students and townies. The way the story went, this guy would come out on Saturday evenings to pick fights with students. The past weekend, he had sat down at a table, uninvited, where a group of students were drinking beer. He just sat there silent and very unwelcome. Eventually, he grabbed the thigh of a male student. He then assaulted them when the student gripped him by the arm and told him to let go. Supposedly, the students all had to go to the hospital due to injuries sustained during the beating. The owner didn't do a thing about it either, also being a townie, I guess. The next Saturday night rolled around and I told my buddies, let's teach this jerk a lesson. I was raised by my dad not to be a victim and to look out for my friends. I played pool and poker to help put myself through school, so I knew how to handle myself. Having heard the townie liked to punch his victims in the solar plexus, I got some magazines and taped them around my torso with a roll of electrical tape. I also got an empty glass Coke bottle and put it in a jacket pocket. And we waited until around 10 p.m. and then headed over to the bar and got a table, leaving one chair empty beside me. We were enjoying a cold pitcher of Pabst when one of my friends told me that he was there now. We made sure not to look at him and kept on drinking. Eventually he came over and sat down in the empty chair beside me. Casually, I turned to look at him and smiled. And sure enough, he immediately grabbed me by my leg. Hey there, fella. I said, still smiling as I took another sip of beer. He had a hard grip on my thigh as he stared back at me, not saying a word. Well, you certainly aren't a shy one, I said, and my friends all laughed. It had grown silent. Everyone in the bar was watching now. I had a nice pinch of Copenhagen snuff between my cheek and gums. I spit into one of his eyes, which caused him to involuntarily close both. Immediately, I punched him in the throat as hard as I could knocking the creep backwards. He fell out of his seat, landing on his butt. Take this outside, yelled the owner from behind the bar. We stepped out into the back alley, followed by the townie. His eyes blazed with anger as he quickly came towards me. He took a swing, which I blocked as I pulled out that glass Coke bottle, gripping it by the neck. I swung back hard, landing a very savage blow against his thick skull. I felt it connect with a very satisfying thud. His head snapped back and he stumbled. I kicked his legs out from under him and then we circled around him and started kicking him with our steel-toed Doc Martens. He tried to get up, but we just kept kicking him as hard as we could, working up a good sweat. He must have tried not to yell or scream, but soon enough he was crying like a baby. And this went on for quite a while until we eventually heard whining sirens approaching us. Let's go, I shouted as we legged it out of there as fast as we could. Later, we were told an ambulance had to come to the bar to cart off the unconscious townie on a stretcher. And needless to say, we didn't return to the club anytime soon again. One time the next year, I went back and saw a townie sitting in a wheelchair beside the bar. He looked like him, but he wasn't so big anymore and trembled a lot. He looked my way eventually and immediately broke eye contact. He never said another word. Oh well, I thought. He had brought it on himself. There are consequences to your actions. My name is Rosa, and I grew up in a place called Killarn, which is about 40 minutes drive away from Glasgow in Scotland. It was a lovely place to grow up, and I have a lot of happy memories of the place, but as a teenager it was very, very boring. Killarn is a small village, and back when I was growing up there in the mid to late 80s, only about 1,500 people called it home. These days, the pubs had a lick of paint, and there's a lovely cafe and restaurant opened up on the high street, but back then, there was basically nothing for younger people to do on the weekend. Killarn is great for an older couple looking for somewhere quiet to retire, but for a bunch of restless teenagers, it felt more like the arse end of nowhere. 
Me and my friends used to get the number 10 bus into Glasgow most Saturdays, but it was an hour's journey each way. So unlike the girls who lived on the outskirts of the city, who would wobble home in their stilettos or jump a taxi home for a fiver, we had to fork out 30 or 40 quid between us just to get home. And that's if we could even find a cab driver who could be bothered to drive that far out of Glasgow city centre when they could be making a mint ferrying drunk people from club to club and all that. It was difficult, but not impossible, and we tried a fair few times when we were 16 and 17 to sneak into clubs without getting ID'd. But the juice wasn't worth the squeeze, as they say, and we resigned ourselves to waiting until we were all 18 before really having a crack at that legendary Glasgow nightlife. It was all a bit depressing, really. We felt proper left out in the cold. But then one day, during the summer before our final year of sixth form, which is the same as a high school senior in America, we heard about this DIY nightclub even taking place in an old farmhouse not too far from home. In the past, all me and my mates had done was hang around a few crappy clubs in the center of Glasgow while being turned away from the better ones because we were 17 and had no IDs. So the idea of going to an unsanctioned rave, that would be way crazier, way cheaper, and wouldn't require us to have any proof of age. It was exactly what we didn't know we'd been waiting for. Now don't get me wrong, we were a bit nervous at the idea when we first heard about it, but after learning that a few other people from our sixth form would be going, we warmed up more and more until we were dead set on attending. It helped that we heard that we had to buy tickets for three pounds, which made the thing seem much more official, but they were literally just printed off of a computer using old school Microsoft Word art and the organizers used the proceeds to rent their sound equipment. It was a completely guerrilla operation, which was a big appeal on one level. We just didn't consider the other implications of it being such an off-the-radar, do-it-yourself kind of party. So, on the night in question, we had to lie to our parents and say that we were going to a party in Glasgow. Not a nightclub, just a friend's birthday thing or something. Then when it was time, we ordered a taxi that our parents thought would be taking us to the train station, but really... It was taking us to the farmhouse a few miles outside of town to where the rave's organizers had set up their sound system. It looked like an absolute pigsty. They'd barely cleaned the place out before setting up, and even though we walked in with our tickets in hand, no one gave us a toss if we had them or not. But most importantly, not only they just assumed that we were of age, but one of the guys was so chuffed to have some girls arrive that he gave us a half-drunk two-liter bottle of vodka when we mentioned not having any drinks with us. And that was the other awful thing about living in Killern. You couldn't kid on to the lady in the shop that you were 18 when she'd personally attended your 17th birthday party just a week before, so getting our hands in alcohol and cigarettes had always been our biggest challenge. But then, there we were, all dolled up, and these lads were literally giving it to us for free. It was like we'd died and gone to heaven. We started dancing in our little group of three, passing around the half-empty bottle of vodka as more and more people started to arrive. By the time we were all feeling nicely tipsy, there had to be at least a hundred people packed into all the different rooms of the old farmhouse. There were even more people chatting and dancing outside, and as the party really got going, the music got even louder, and the atmosphere got even better. It was just wild. Total chaos, but with the best vibes, at least until my friend Lucy noticed that someone was going around selling pills out of a clear plastic baggie. We'd never seen actual drugs up close like that before. I mean, we had trouble getting our hands on a bottle of Buckfast, so... Forget about soap bar or whiz or anything like that. The guy gets around to us, we ask what he's selling, and when he said ecstasy, we told him thanks, but no thanks, as we didn't have any money. Unlike the rave's organizers, who gave us some of their booze, the guy with the pills wasn't nearly as generous with his stash, and just moved on when we said we didn't have any money. But that suited me fine. I was feeling more than adventurous enough as it was, Anyway, we carry on drinking, carry on dancing, and eventually we're all bursting for a wee. We knew the toilets in that place would be shocking to say the least, so we avoided going for as long as possible. 
We even floated the idea of just running off into a bush somewhere if it were too disgusting. But when we finally got the courage to go, we found the queue was absolutely massive. There was one single outside toilet that had working plumbing, which is what made me think the organizers rented the place or something, as opposed to it being a complete derelict. God knows if the owners knew what they intended to do with the place. If they'd known, I doubt that they'd be so quick to hand over the keys. But either way, we were in no position to wait in queue for that long, so we went with the original plan of just scampering off into a bush for a wee tinkle. Just down the way from the farmhouse was this long, overgrown hedgerow, and behind it a patch of trees. It looked like a nice concealed spot, so we made our way over to it, skirted around the edge, and then walked off into the trees to get a bit more cover. The last thing we wanted was for any boys to wander after us and catch us with our knickers down, so we walked for a minute or two to put some distance between us and the hedge. But then suddenly, I remember looking to my left and getting an awful fright, because standing there, leaning up against a tree, was a girl with very pale features, and she was just staring at me with this very hazy, vacant look. She didn't look well, but she didn't look scary at all, it was just her sudden presence that gave me a bit of a fright. But then after that initial reaction, me and my friends started asking her if she was okay, because as I said, she looked very unwell. The poor girl was slurring her words, her jaw was swinging, and she just kept mumbling, I don't feel well, I just want to go home. We asked her what her name was, and she repeated, I don't feel well. We had to ask her several times just to tell us what her name was. We then tried asking her if she was taking anything, but by that point, we were pretty certain that she needed some sort of medical assistance. So instead of continuing to ask her questions we weren't going to get answers to, one of my friends threw one of her arms over each of our shoulders and we started to walk back towards the farmhouse. It took us a while to do it, but we managed to get her around the edge and all the way back to the farmhouse before sitting her down outside against a stone wall. We then asked the people around us for help and were shocked by how little some people seemed to care. Some total idiots there openly just didn't give a toss and made fun of the girl as she sat there looking all pale and ill. But enough good people did care, and eventually, we found someone who knew one of the organizers who said they had a van with them that had been used to transport all the sound equipment. Essentially, he was this girl's ticket to the hospital. There were no mobile phones back then, and the farmhouse might have had a bit of plumbing work, but... There was no working phone line for us to use to call an ambulance. We could run to the nearest tarmacked road and hope that we caught the attention of a passing car, but the situation seemed far too urgent to risk relying on something like that. We needed someone with a vehicle, who could drive, and we needed them immediately. The nice person who knew one of the organizers said that they'd go and get him, so we waited where we were and hoped one of the sick girl's friends might spot her while walking past. We tried getting their names from the girl, but she kept saying her own name in confusion, so there was no way of us to get the word out that she was unwell aside from just kind of advertising her to passers-by in the hopes that they'd recognize her. It all felt a wee bit hopeless, really, and the worse the girl got, the more and more panicked we got. But there was a momentary feeling of relief when one of the rave's organizers showed up after having heard that there was some kind of emergency. We told him what the situation was, that this girl had too much to drink, etc. And at first, he's being good as gold, saying, Oh yeah, I'll take your friend to the hospital. It's the least I can do. No dramas, and all of this. But then, when we showed him the girl that we were talking about, he took one look at her, and his face changed. It was like he knew her from somewhere, or recognized something about her that we weren't seeing. There was this dramatic change in his expression, too. He went from calm and confident, stepping in to be the knight in shining armor to a group of young damsels, to what seemed to be almost scared. I asked him what the matter was, and he said that he'd be back in a minute, that he just needed to talk to someone. I told him that we didn't have time for that, blah blah blah, and went to grab his wrist as he walked away. He responded by violently throwing me off and then shooting me this very furious look before he disappeared into the crowd. 
Fair enough, I shouldn't have grabbed him like that, but that feeling of helplessness got ramped up to a thousand. We suddenly went from everything is going to be fine to what the bloody hell is going on. The worst thing was is that very few people seemed to be taking the situation remotely seriously. Drunk lads were walking up to the semi-conscious girl and asking, Yeah, right, hen. Want to just cab back to my place and sleep it off and other horrible pervy things like that. We had to tell them that it wasn't funny and that people get really sick from having way too much to drink. And that's when one lad said something like, She's not had too much to drink. She's had a pill and it's not agreeing with her. She needs water and an ambulance. We asked how he knew she'd taken a pill, like he was some kind of wreckhead whisperer or something, able to silently communicate with those who'd taken the knock. But he just replied, Because I watched her take it. I'll be back with a bottle of water. And that's when we really started the panic, because it became more and more obvious that the girl hadn't just had too much to drink. She was overdosing on ecstasy. She was overheated, sweaty, confused, and she was beginning to lose consciousness, so if the organizer person with the van didn't get her to the hospital soon, she was going to be in some very serious trouble. I got sick of waiting for the guy to come back, so I went looking for him. I found him a few minutes later, and although I couldn't hear what he was saying, the guy he was saying it to was hanging on to every word. I walked up to him saying something along the lines of, What are you waiting for? We need to get that girl to a hospital. But then the second he realized I'd followed him inside, he got really angry and started telling me to go wait outside and that he'd be there in a few minutes. But then I realized something. The same guy he was talking to, the one who was hanging on to every word, was the same guy that had offered to sell us pills only about an hour earlier. The organizer knew the girl was overdosing, and he was prioritizing his drug dealer friend over a girl who was in serious danger after taking something he'd sold her. Obviously, I don't know exactly what they were saying to each other, but I imagine the organizer was warning his dealer friend that the police might be on their way at some point because he was about to drive a girl to a hospital after taking one of his pills. The thing was, I couldn't understand why that wasn't just a two-sentence conversation. Someone's life was at stake, and this pair of clowns were having a small discussion about it instead of doing the right thing and coming to the rescue. I didn't just go back and wait with my friends. I stayed put, and the more they talked, the angrier and angrier I got. Where was the oh-so-manly savior who claimed to have it all under control? He seemed to have disappeared the moment he realized his actions might affect his friend's profit margin. If just hearing that makes you angry... Imagine how I felt having to stand there looking at him. But sadly, this is where I made a huge mistake. I lost my rag, and I started to hit him. I didn't proper closed fist punch the guy or anything like that, but I started open-handed smacking him on his shoulder. It was mainly just to get his attention, but I was so angry that it instantly became a minor assault as I'm screaming at him, What are you waiting for? We need to go, we need to go now. He turned around shoved me back into the crowd of people, and then everything went to hell. I'm not saying I didn't deserve a shove. It's never okay to put your hands on someone like that when words could do just as well, but all anyone really saw was this big, quite husky bloke shoving this wee girl before she went flying. To the crowd of people, it was him that was in the wrong, and immediately a bunch of hard cases start stepping towards the guy like, oh, shoving a girl, are we? Well, why don't you shove me, big man? If that gets lost in translation somehow, they wanted to kick his head in because he'd pushed a girl, and they had a proper good go of it too. It was the organizer and his dealer friend versus about five lads who emerged from the crowd to start throwing punches. It was horrifying, not just because of how much violence had erupted so quickly, but because I thought that I'd buggered up our one good chance of getting this overdosing girl a lift to hospital. I tried to break it up, got knocked over again and I just remember starting to cry as some kind stranger pulled me away from the fight and asked me if I was okay. I couldn't get the words out so I just dragged the guy outside by his wrist basically and showed him the girl and my mates. It was a terrible scene and the girl was unconscious and even though me and the kind stranger could see that, my friends kept saying, oh my god Rosa, she's unconscious now, we, we gotta do something. 
That's when we did what we should have done about 10 to 15 minutes ago by that point, which was pick up the girl and carry her to the nearest road to wave down a passing driver. I remember it was the summer before our Mach A levels, so even though it was about 10 o'clock, there was still enough light for us to be able to follow the path back to the road relatively easily. The kind stranger had enlisted the help of two of his mates as well, so they carried the unconscious girl to the road while we ran ahead to flag down a car. There was another few minutes of feeling hopeless as we stood there, waiting for a car to appear, and when one finally did, there was the added fear that it wouldn't stop for us. I personally remember thinking that it wasn't out of the question that someone would see a load of screaming teenagers carrying an unconscious girl and just think, no thanks. But luckily, they didn't. The person driving pulled over their car, wound down a window, and then asked what was going on. They only had to hear the word overdose before they were shouting, get her into the back. The bloke was driving on his own, so there was room for me, my two friends, and the girl who was overdosing, but obviously no room for any of the lads. But they just waved us off and told the fella to drive, and he did, all the way over to Vale of Levin Hospital over in Alexandria. Pretty much everyone, from the driver to the doctors and nurses at Vale of Levin, assumed that we were the girl's friends, which I suppose we were, given the absence of the people that she went to the rave with. We had to tell them that we were just some strangers and didn't know the girl, but even if we did, once we got her to the hospital, that was where our time with her ended. There was a waiting room with a payphone, so instead of walking out into town with no way of getting home, I called my parents and begged them to come pick us up. Of course, there was the whole issue that we'd lied about where we were going, and my mom was furious at first. But by the time she and my dad arrived to give us a lift home, they changed their attitudes completely. I suppose they must have talked about it on the drive over. Yeah, we'd lied, but all we'd done was drink a bit of vodka, and not even all that much before we went off to pee and found the girl overdosing. After that, what we'd done was take responsibility for a girl who'd probably would have died if we hadn't have done something. Now don't get me wrong, I had my social life scrutinized for months afterwards, but I wasn't punished for lying as I would have been otherwise and neither were any of my friends. Obviously it wasn't a big media story or anything like that, so it's not like we could stay up to date with the girl's condition by watching some TV or listening to the radio. I think the girl's family would have gone mental if something appeared in the papers anyways, but we didn't even know her name. The only thing I could have done was phone up the hospital to try and speak to some of the nurses that were on shift that night, but I don't know. I just didn't. I think because it was such a sensitive situation involving an overdose, I didn't really want to interfere or inject myself, if that makes sense. So I just went on hoping that she made a full recovery and assumed that I wouldn't hear anything else about it. That was proven untrue as when the police showed up at my parents' house. They wanted to know if I knew anything about who might have given the girl the pill, and since I was pretty sure that I got a good look at him, I passed along the man's description to the police. I know that might make me a uh, grass or whatever you want to call it, but I honestly don't care. If that dealer and his pal had jumped into action, rushed that girl to the hospital, and generally taken responsibility for the situation, then I might not have been so quick to grass them up. But since they acted like a pair of complete cowards, dilly-dallying while a girl was having a serious health episode, I didn't think twice about dropping them in it. I doubt the police would have found the guy based on my crap description of him alone, but if it helped, then good. I know the teenagers are always going to go out and take drugs, but if the people selling them are going to take their money and not even bother to help them when they have a bad reaction, then they deserve to be in jail, if you ask me. I used to work in a nightclub that stayed open until 5am and those last couple of hours could get pretty rough. We operated a pretty strict door policy but there's very little you can do about the folks who turn up semi-sober at like midnight and then end up trashed and shirtless come closing. Closing time was always a messy process, especially on weekends, when all the patrons would spill out onto the streets outside at roughly the same time. There'd be romance, drama, fights. 
and slowly but surely the crowd would disperse and cabs are on foot. Then, this one time, we had one particular guy get kicked out around closing for trying to start fights with people. He was wasted, it was all posturing and sloppy shoving, so not exactly a huge threat to really anyone. But then after he gets himself kicked out, he stays outside the club, talking crap to anyone who could come outside. The bouncer's presence alone was keeping him at bay, and then when we closed, he carried on harassing people, but somehow managed to avoid any violence. I think he was just so wasted and incapable that people didn't think that he was even worth the effort. Plus, by the time people were dispersing, he was shirtless and looked like he might have just puked on himself a little, so I imagine people didn't even want to be near him, let alone get close enough to fight. And little by little, the crowd of people began to disperse until it was literally just the shirtless drunk guy wandering in and out of the streets trying to harass passing cars. I remember my coworker called me over like, get a load of this guy, he's still out there. And at first, we were just kind of laughing at him, trying not to get spotted through the big glass windows in the process. He's walking into the street, and at every passing car, he's posturing like he's challenging it to a fight. And every time he's doing it, me and my coworker are just laughing our butts off and recording him on our phones. A car is only coming along maybe every few minutes or so, because it's still like 6am at this point, so the streets hadn't quite woken up yet, so we had to wait between all of his challenges. But then suddenly, a car drives past the guy and he lands a kick on it so loud that we heard it from the bar. The driver of the car blasts their horn, stops for a second, and then just speeds off. Shirtless guy starts laughing, giving the driver the finger, and right as he's celebrating this sort of little victory over the car, my coworker says word for word, if he keeps doing that, man, he's going to get himself hurt. Well, no sooner does he say that, the same car shirtless guy kicked comes back speeding the other way and it smashes into him so hard that he literally went spinning in the air. I remember just recoiling from the window in shock, and my coworker doing the same thing. She just kept saying, oh my god, oh my god, but then as the car reappeared and reversed over the guy as he was lying there, the pitch of her voice picked up so that she went from talking to screaming. Seeing the guy smashed into the air was one thing, something I'll remember for as long as I live. But seeing him get his torso crushed by the reversing tires, both sets too, is something I think that I'll see in my nightmares every so often till I die. Just the sound of it alone was one of the worst things I'd ever heard. Just this sort of deep gagunk, gagunk, as each set of wheels ripped over him. And I do mean ripped because after the second hit, you could see the blood where the rubber had dragged away the skin of his chest and back. I didn't look for too long. I grabbed my phone and dialed 911, pacing back and forth on the floor in front of the bar as I focused on telling the dispatcher all she needed to know. The EMTs were outside first, and then two cops showed up to ask us all a few questions. Our manager bought us all drinks, then stayed after we all left to get all the relevant security camera footage for the cops. And the following evening, we all had the night off because it was Sunday, but... Me, my boss, and my co-workers were all talking in this group text, updating each other on what was going on. We all wanted to know if the shirtless guy was going to be okay. Like, I know it might sound kind of naive, but people do survive some crazy injuries sometimes. But the very next morning, we found out that he died. The cops had reached out to our manager saying that since the guy died, the investigation has become a homicide. And this meant that we'd have to talk to the cops all over again, but this time it'd be with two homicide detectives who wanted to talk to whoever was on shift that night, which obviously meant me. They basically wanted to know if the person who ran over this shirtless guy could have been someone he clashed with earlier that night. But from where I was standing, it just seemed totally random. We don't really get people walking out of the club wasted than getting straight into their cars, and for obvious reasons... So from where I was standing, the shirtless guy was unlucky enough to kick the car of someone in a very bad mood who had to be up early that Sunday morning or something. And honestly, that's what I find so scary about this whole thing. It all happened so fast, and the guy confronted so many drivers who just ignored him and drove off before 
he finally just so happened to come across that one psycho who turned around, hit him, and then reversed over him afterwards. And that's why I'm always polite with people, especially during tense situations. I don't let people just walk all over me. A person can be firm but respectful, make concessions but set boundaries. But the thing I never ever want to be is careless enough to trigger that one psycho who's been waiting all day and night to take their spite out on someone. I'm not talking about that psycho who's looking for trouble either, because God help you if you're that person that comes along. I'm talking about the real psychos, the button-down, repressed emotions, hair-trigger psychos who see red, totally lose themselves, and then do something terrible. They're the ones I'm scared of, because they're the ones who won't hesitate to kill you. The scariest thing I ever experienced happened on one of the most boring nights of my entire life. I used to work in bars and nightclubs all over London. Nine different places in seven years too, just hopping from venue to venue wherever it suited me. Sometimes I'd leave a place for better money elsewhere, and other times because my boss or supervisors were just absolute tossers. But then one place, I handed in my notice after going through something so frightening that it gave me nightmares that persisted for years. As anyone who's worked in bars or nightclubs will tell you, January tends to be the quietest month of the year. Everyone has a massive blowout over the Christmas break and New Year's and then tries to watch their pennies and their waistlines come the New Year. I imagine it's been like that since forever and it's just something just us bar staff have to live with. You squirrel away your Christmas tips so you can last through everyone's dry January and then just hope that you get enough shifts to see you comfortably through the month. At first, I thought I was lucky that my name kept popping up on the hugely scaled down rota. I went for about 50 hours a week in December to less than 30 in January, which was definitely a massive hit, but others had it far worse than I did. I'd started at around 6pm and then we'd close up at around midnight and all that time, the bar only needed to be manned by one person. Sometimes that'd be me, sometimes it'd be a colleague, but on this night in particular, it was so quiet that just our manager was manning the front of the house while me and a colleague busied ourselves with a bit of early spring cleaning. The Christmas period had been manic, so there was plenty of sprucing up to do. We tidied up the staff room upstairs, bagged up a load of lost property, then went down into the beer cellar to tidy that up too. There were all kinds of empty boxes to crush, to take out the bins, so we occupied ourselves doing that for a while. We'd walked into the cellar, crush a few boxes, and then walk out again with them stacked in our arms, and once the box crushing part of the job was boxed off, pun very much intended, we decided to take a little breather in the cellar. We were there for no more than a few minutes, sat atop some boxes of beer, swapping some small talk, when I felt a headache coming on. It wasn't all that strong at first, so I made a mental note to grab a paracetamol from the stash that we kept upstairs, then just carried on talking to my colleague. But then, a minute or so later... I started feeling even worse. I stood up, felt a bit wobbly, and told my colleague something like, I'm feeling a bit strange, man. I'm just going to get a bit of fresh air. He stood up too. Then, as I turned to walk towards the door of the cellar, he said, and I'll never forget this as long as I live, best get the bowl of car keys first, though, Jay. I turned back for a second, quite certain that I was going completely mental, and asked my colleague to repeat himself, only to watch his knees buckle before he crashed into the stacks of beer boxes next to him. We stack them in a particular way so that impacts like that don't take down a whole stack and endanger anyone with broken glass or something, but my colleague hit them so hard that I'd swear a few bottles must have broken from the force of that fall. And I was just stunned at first, but then it hit me. Dizziness, nausea, confusion, loss of consciousness. It was a gas leak. A carbon dioxide leak to be exact. Oh, and just to explain, the cellar of most bars has all their CO2 tanks which we hook up to the bars upstairs via pipes so we can carbonate your drinks and make them all nice and fizzy. The leak was a massive one too. 
and because of the ambient hum of the old coolers down in our cellar, we couldn't hear the rush of gas from one of the barrels that was leaking it. I ran out of the cellar, took a deep breath, and then ran back in to grab my colleague by one of his legs and then just pulled harder than I'd ever pulled before, managed to drag his unconscious carcass out of the cellar and into the little hallway outside before I slammed the door closed. Then, in a total panic, I started trying to wake my colleague up, slapping him in the face, shouting his name. I don't think I could ever properly describe the relief that I felt when he opened his eyes. He seemed really groggy and confused, and he rolled over and suddenly threw up, which made me get up to try and keep him on his side. I felt my knees wobble as I got up, and I barely kept myself from toppling over as I went to make sure that he was firmly on his side. I didn't want him rolling back over, throwing up again, and then choking on his own vomit, so I did that and then told him that I was going to get help. Trying to make it up the stairs was incredibly scary too. I kept thinking that I was going to black out and that it would probably be ages before our manager came looking for us. That and I was scared of falling backwards, toppling down the stairs and breaking my neck. I remember holding on really tight to the railing that went up to the side of the staircase. Then as I spilled through the staff only door and out into the bar itself, I shouted to my manager to call an ambulance. We only had one couple sat at the bar and they were amazing. One of them had their phone out and was dialing 999 before my manager had even stopped whatever she was doing. It wasn't like she'd panicked or didn't care or whatever, she just sort of froze in fright when I shouted at her, while the cool-headed punter, who probably had a few drinks in him already, was just on it like a comet. And the worst was over, as I'd already dragged my colleague out of the cellar where the gas leak was, so by the time me and my manager got back downstairs, he was sat on the stairs leaning up against the wall, almost fully conscious again. He looked red in the face, like he'd been running around in our absence, and since I still wasn't feeling great myself, I was scared to try and support him coming up the stairs. Thankfully, my manager and one of the couples at the bar teamed up to basically drag my sick colleague back up the stairs again. An ambulance showed up a few minutes later, took us both off to a hospital, and the doctors agreed that both sets of symptoms were consistent with acute carbon dioxide poisoning. We were told just how incredibly lucky we'd been, too. Most incidents of CO2 poisoning are slow burn affairs, and the victims often notice the milder symptoms long before it has the chance to kill them. Whereas in our case, a ton of carbon monoxide was being pumped into the cellar really quickly, so we were being exposed to a much larger amount in a much shorter amount of time. The doctors had absolutely no doubt that if both me and my colleague had passed out in that cellar at the same time, or I'd failed to pull them out in time, then someone would have lost their life that night. And while we were receiving treatment at a local accident and emergency department, our manager was closing down the bar after placing an emergency call to her own bosses further up the chain of command. I got to go home that night and my colleague didn't. He'd suffered a severe reaction to it, whereas I'd only suffered a minor one. I asked the doctors why that might be, and they told me a number of factors that might be to blame, just nothing that they'd be able to pinpoint without any study and observation. He stayed overnight, and the bar was closed for a couple of days afterwards, but in that time, we kept in touch via phone and discussed what came next. And long story short, we both received a very large and very generous settlement from the financial group that owned the bar. I know that might be weird to say that when we nearly died, but their logic was this. They were going to sue the butt off the company that made the leaky gas canister. In the words of the woman I spoke to, they were going to pick them up, turn them upside down, and shake them until every last penny fell out. They knew they were going to win too, and they'd make a hell of a lot of money doing so but they didn't want to fight two court cases at the same time. It meant double the legal fees with the same end result, so paying us such a large amount was, and I'm quoting here, expedient. I won't say how much they offered us, but it was enough to make each of us drop any ideas of hiring solicitors. Enough to live comfortably while looking for another job, and enough to put quite a bit away for a rainy day, which was something I'd always been lacking. I don't work in bars or nightclubs anymore, and I can't say I really miss it either, but I do miss the people. It's a hard job. It's a weird job, and much like any job like that, you sometimes develop quite a deep camaraderie with the people you work with. 
I can't imagine not running back into that room to pull my colleague out after he'd collapsed. And I know that if the roles were reversed, and that was me, he'd have done exactly the same thing. Maybe it's just basic human decency and I sound like an idiot trying to compare pulling pints to Band of Brothers, but I stand by it. I don't miss work, but for better or worse, I do miss the people. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday and Thursday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday and Wednesday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about all the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, don't be yippin' about the yappin'.